Hi, good, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our first in-person working in UX design uh, event. Um, for the, and I got my CV from the panel. So I've always wanted to do an in-person event uh, since, ever since we did this webinar format like two years ago, uh, before uh, during the COVID pandemic. So uh, and we always wanted to do it and then live stream it. And that's exactly what we're doing today. And we have a live audience here uh, at Skate, at Orchard, but we also have like uh, people down again uh, from overseas as well as uh, from Singapore, right? So welcome to all our audiences. Um, and I would like to introduce our speaker today, uh, our speaker of the month. Uh, his name is Subra. I got to know him because my co-instructor, Tika, um, mentioned about his portfolio and, and she said, uh, Atika works at the Rocket Ten VT and she said, hey, uh, Subra has an awesome portfolio, you should check it out. And I went to check it out and indeed he does have an awesome portfolio, uh, which he will be sharing later so you can go and check out uh, the website. Uh, and I said, hey, maybe you can uh, share with us how to build a better portfolio, right? It's a lot of thought you put into it, you treat it like a product. Uh, so that's uh, what we're going to talk about today and about breaking into this industry and that process that he did to build his portfolio. So Subra has worked for over three years uh, in user experience design and he's a graduate of Republic Polytechnic in the user experience diploma program. Uh, anyone from RP here? <laughs> awesome! <laughs> okay, so he has his friends over here and uh, he's a very passionate product designer uh, and he uses design to connect people, business, and technology. And currently he works at Food Panda. Any Food Panda users here today? Just give me a raise your hands if you're using Food Panda. Sometimes. Okay, awesome. I'm using Food Panda. I love the design. And uh, it's, it's under the company called Delivery Hero APAC. And he focuses on the incentive experience for customers globally. So it's not just Singapore, but a global portfolio. And prior to this, he has continued his work in UX in companies such as NTUC, Enterprise, as well as Thales, uh, who is actually supporting us as one of the career boosts here. In 2018, he was awarded the Lee Sien Long Interactive Digital Media Smart Nation Award alongside his team members for their work in improving the lives of Singapore, uh, of people with intellectual disabilities. So we do, that's a lot of community stuff. So without further ado, can we please get a round of applause for our speaker uh, today, uh, and I'll be interviewing Subra. Uh, so Subra, please join me over here. <laughs> All right, let's have a seat. Awesome. Hi everyone, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you really for that amazing introduction as well. Um, finally, good to see everyone like personal and like live upfront. Yeah, it's like been two years of and mask off. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> that is the whole ring mask. Lovely. So I, I know you prepared some slides uh, for us today, but maybe let's just start with like um, a very, very brief introduction about your work. You know, what do you do on a day to day basis as a UX designer at like Food Panda? Um, at Food Panda, uh, so currently, like I mentioned, I'm working for like an incentive experience. So I mainly focus uh, for my Q commerce customers. So basically, your Panda Mart, your shops. So those are the kind of customers that I work with. And I also normally connect like technology, so that's talking to my developers and like really knowing um, if something is usable or not, or whether my design is um, good enough. So I will talk to my product managers as well. So it's really connecting technology, product, and as well as business needs, and also hearing our customers, right? So connecting all those is like, I think my way to go as a user. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. And how is it like working with one of the fastest growing startups here in the region? Yeah, so, so when I was interviewing with them, I think one thing you told me was that we are a startup, but right now they are more than a startup, I think. So they have been working with uh, multiple companies. So I work with Delivery Hero. So even though in Singapore it's called Food Panda, there's a couple of like um, like other brands that we work with um, in other countries, and it kind of ties it kind of ties all of those together. So I think um, it's very, um, I would say, kind of tricky because like different countries have different user needs. Like in Singapore, you like talk to people and then you're like, okay, this is what they require. But if I come in Pakistan, um, they have like these things whereby the stores are so far away and we don't know how to get it to them and they're like, 
how our bodies will work with them as well. So we have to kind of think about like localization as well. So it's very different across like um, countries, and I think that's very interesting, and that's something I really love that put back up. Okay, by the way, I can help you with the slides, uh, just so you can focus. All so, right, thank you. <laughs> I know you prepared like a brief introduction and, and has like a little hello sign. Like, is there anything you want to tell us about yourself today? I think you have only really <laughs> like this very well. So I think yeah, I think this is one of my um, start lines for my um, portfolio itself. So the reason for me to put this here is just to know like who am I, what do I do, and like ultimately what is the goal I'm trying to achieve. So I think that's a kind of the opening line that I only use for like portfolio itself. Yeah, and personally as an instructor, I've seen a lot of portfolios, and I know how important it is to like introduce and brand yourself. So just tell me a little bit about the process that. Uh, you, or the thought that you put into to come up with all these words and why did you only stick to, I guess, I guess one sentence? Yeah, because like one thing that we I think have to keep in mind is people don't have a lot of time in their hand. Um, they probably have about like one minute to just look at the portfolio. So in that sense, I knew that if I'm going to introduce something, it has to be simple, short, and just introduce myself in a very fun way, right? And for them to just get to know me without going through. So if without going through my portfolio itself. So for example, if this like entitles them, then it will look further for my portfolio and like it will go into my details as well. So just wanted the opening line to like kind of make an impact and just be about me. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Um, is there a conscious reason why you put an emoji over there? Uh, not really. I like emoji. <laughs> so I really like using emojis and I thought it's a bit more personal um, because I feel like a lot of uh, portfolios that we have out there, it is um, very good. Um, I got reference from a lot of very great portfolios, but I personally felt I wanted like a personal touch. Hence like that emoji and like being a person of color, right? So I just wanted to put that brown uh, hand as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> diversity <laughs> represent. Yeah, okay. That's right. Okay, I think that's that's a really good point. I think that are some things we can learn. And often when I notice about portfolios, like uh, we want to put and present our best selves. So we want to put things that we're strong at and things that we're interested in and so, so that we differentiate ourselves. So I think this, really serves as a, as a good introduction to Supra. And do you find that it's cohesive to, to the person so far? Yes, yeah. Okay, awesome. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we have, we have a little timeline over here and I think there's a lot of pictures. Um, I love it that you're showing rather than you're telling. So yeah, tell us a little bit about what's going on. Yeah, sure. So I kind of started my career back in 2018. So um, after finishing my diploma in 2018, I started out doing my first job. So I was an intern actually at Thales. So uh, that's where I kind of learned about all the kind of different technologies that they work with. And, and um, it was quite complex actually to understand. So coming as an intern, I wouldn't say that I, I, was, I was quite shocked actually. I was like, wow, so this is direct design. You know? So I was kind of interested in it, kind of put my um, like, thoughts. So I was very curious. I think I would thank Thales for that. Um, and right after that, I think I went for my smart mission competition. So I think that's like you mentioned about how we work with uh, people with intellectual disabilities, right? So I think that was my final year project, but um, fortunately I was able to move that project forward uh, to move it to like a competition level, I would say. But even then, I think we didn't just view it as a competition. We were continuing to work with people with intellectual disabilities as well as their caregivers to kind of create this ecosystem for them. So I think that uh, was my smart nation photo over there. Uh, we were kind of published and yeah, it was great stuff. Um, and then I did a little bit of freelancing as well. So um, right after uh, my graduation, I decided to like, join some startup um, just to gain some experience. And that's when a lot of those freelancing happened. Uh, and then I went to national service. Every Singaporean has to go for national service. So that was me as well. Uh, but right after my national service, I decided to freelance a little bit more and really understand um, the different kind of companies that I perhaps would like. So I think my one of my companies that I freelance with was like this tuition center. So it was kind of unique because normally you don't really hear about US and tuition centers, right? So I think I was just helping them to um, do their branding and really understanding like what they need and talking to like their students as well. So that was the tuition center. And I also kind of freelance with this uh, company where they bring internet of things. So IoT stuff, and yeah, so that kind of completes my freelancing, which eventually led me to know that, okay, I want to do something which is more product-based. Um, I wanted to venture from then onwards, and then I joined NTUC. Uh, that's where I began my e-commerce journey, per se. So really understanding how the whole end-to-end e-commerce journey works, and my focus was mainly on like logistics, as well as like consumer experience. So I worked on the backend, end and things like that. And then eventually I also launched um, recipes. 
alongside my co team and this um, fair price. So that was awesome. And currently, yes, I am crafting experience at Food Panda. Um, so it's an awesome company. You can see Pao Pao on the top right. That's our <laughs> cute uh, panda as well. Yeah. I, I think what I noticed from your experience is that you chose not to do a degree. Is, is there a conscious reason why? Yeah, because I kind of knew already that I wanted to be in UX. And I think my diploma in UX gave me a lot of knowledge. And RP is a great place that really um, pushed me forward to know that, okay, UX is something I wanted to do. And I didn't talk to myself that, hey, you know, doing a degree would probably um, strengthen my thinking further. But however, I wanted to dabble in the industry. I wanted to know what the industry is doing, what's going on, so that I can gain experience through that, that degree. So I think that's why I, I decided to stick to my diploma and go for companies instead. And I think I'll also represent the audience by asking, you know, when, when, you did, when you went out, when you went for job interviews and you didn't have a degree, did you kind of meet rejections because you didn't have like a university degree? Yeah, definitely. I think it's a, I've met with rejection quite a number of times, especially through emails and whatnot, right? Um, I will talk later about the, the kind of uh, struggle I kind of had when I was first starting out with uh, finding um, a job at uh, NTUC. So yeah, okay. I'll, I'll I think we'll go into that. Another thing I'm noticing from the timeline is like how you're hustling even after school. Like I remember when I was that age I when I was playing computer games all the time, like even when I was in NS. So I noticed like you're doing freelancing and you're even like after NS you're doing freelancing again. How how did you manage to like obtain these types of opportunities? Yeah, I think I was also quite a playful person back in school, so no difference. But yeah, um, I think mainly for me um, about the freelancing is just to know what are my skills and like how um, I can have a niche as well. So really trying to like hone uh, my UI skills, I think that was the first thing I wanted to do with my freelance, really to have a strong um, skill set when I'm going to move into the industry, right? So that was mainly uh, the reason why I freelance. And how I come about this freelance is again through connections. I think networking is one very important thing, which I'll also touch again on later. Oh, excellent. We have excellent sideways. Um, hope you're excited for the next part of the interview. So, um, yeah, overall, I, I think you have a lot of pictures over here. Uh, did you find it valuable to do like a competition and an event like the, the one that you did? I, I think that was that was not not a paid gig, right? Uh, yeah, so for the smart nation, if you were to win, then you get paid. So that's how it kind of um, works. And also for students, they don't really pay that high, right? So it's just like you know, a small token of appreciation, they would say. Um, yeah, I think for me personally, um, doing that competition really meant something because when I was doing my final project, um, and I was talking to all these caregivers and like and the people that I meet, um, at, for example, I was looking at Minds, by the way, it's the movement for intellectual disability in Singapore. So when I was working with them and I went down to like kind of do my research and really understand about them, right? Um, it showed me the kind of value I could bring in the US. I think that was kind of my turning point in the sense that I knew that this is the career I wanted because I wanted to kind of solve problems and I could see the urgent user need. And I knew that if I was to create a good experience, it would impact many people. And I think that itself was, was why I decided to pursue my career. So even though the competition did not have, um, I would say like given me lots of rewards or whatnot, I think it was for me an, an impact of trying to do that. Yeah. Okay, that's lovely. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about uh, positioning yourself as a as a designer. And uh, I know you have some sharings over there. Uh, and we talk a little bit about your introduction. So let's let's continue. Like, what are some of the conscious things you did uh, to position yourself as a designer? Like, what what are the things that you you were very clear about uh, when you're branding yourself? Okay, so when I talk about positioning, and that's a great question by the way, I think for positioning, um, it's really knowing what you can offer, um, be it your company, be it yourself, but when you're confident with what you are able to offer, I think the company will be able to appreciate it as well. So for example, I think there's two, uh, I was reading some article and they had these two particular positioning. So one is called role positioning, meaning the kind of role you play in the company, what does it um, require to do. So really understanding the roles that a company needs, and how you can position it that way. So for example, when I was um, applying for like NQC, right? My role at the time was just wanting to be in the industry, just wanting to work in the industry and know um, and learn more about the product itself. So at that stage, I was positioning myself as someone who wants to learn, uh, someone who wants to grow, and I just showed them my work that, okay, I'm kind of good at, for example, my UI skills, and can I you know, move further from that? So I positioned myself at that 
stage at, the, at that time that way. Um, but then I think the other one is really knowing your niche, um, whether you're good in UX or UI or like research. So when you have that niche, right, that's when you know you can um, develop further. You, know, you, you can know what you can improve on as well. So I think positioning is really about knowing um, what you want to achieve as well. So that is for, sorry, just a quick one is that, that is for the role positioning and then the platform positioning as well. So for platform positioning, it's mainly the kind of companies they want to apply for. So when, after NQC, I knew that, okay, I had a good knowledge with e-commerce, right? I, I wanted to either improve in the e-commerce further uh, with more kind of users or I want to do like logistic stuff. So I was kind of interested in that. So really knowing the kind of platform that you want to position yourself for as well as your role. Yeah. So I'm just going to ask you, uh, go a little bit deeper on your role positioning like what are, what are some of the conscious things that you did to position yourself as you are in for that particular role because what i sense from you is like if, when you're breaking into the industry it's like you want to communicate that you have a great attitude and that you're hungry right what are the things that you consciously put on your website or your cv that that shows that okay so when i was doing my cv so i kind of put about the impacts that i'm making for the company so then they know that, okay, what impact has he made for the company? How is he going to be beneficial to my business? So I think we kind of have to think it from a company's perspective as well. So as much as we want to really show everything, I think we also have to kind of tweak it a bit to see what does the company really want. So for example, when I go on LinkedIn, I'll be like, okay, there's a couple of like requirements that this company needs, but what are they particularly looking for? And from then, I kind of print my CV for that particular company and I send it to them. But ideally, the CV will still look the same, but it's just that you put the information according to what the company needs. So for example, um, when I was applying to one company, I said that, oh, I made in this much of impact within logistics. So I applied it to a logistics company. When I'm applying to an e-commerce company, I talk about, oh, what have I done for the consumer facing, or even just a little bit of logistics, not like too much of it. Yeah. So I think it really depends on how you want to um, um, kind of tweak your CV, I would say. I, I, I really like that, and I'm, I'm going to get into numbers, if you don't mind. So I, I would like to ask you, you know, the jobs you applied and the response rate, like how much was that? Just, just by the nature of you actually tweaking your CV, you know? Um, okay, so I did apply to about 15 companies. I heard that's a bit too much actually, so. <laughs> did you say 50, five, zero? No, 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 15, one, five, one, five. One, five. Yes, 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 so about 15 companies. Um, but when I was applying to those companies, I didn't get response. Um, okay, so what I did actually, which is really helpful to me, I created an Excel sheet, um, actually on Notion itself, I created a table of like all the companies I've applied for, and like what is this industry about, and then what's the role that I'm applying for. So that kind of gets me an overview of like, these are all the companies I have, and are they getting back to me, not getting back to me, am I rejected, am I accepted, that kind of thing. So I got response actually from, um, what, 12 companies, so I really got a good response, I would say, so thankful to all those companies that are getting a very good response. I, yeah, I would say that's an amazing response, because usually, from what I understand, you get about a 10 to 20% kind of like response rate, uh, if you don't customize it, but you're getting way more than 50%, so that's, that's actually great. Yeah, thank you so much, yeah, I think that was really great as well, uh, but I think one thing that I also kind of learned is, when I was applying to all these companies, right, because these are companies that I wanted to be part of, and I knew that I kind of like, what they were doing, um, but I also had to tell myself that as I progress further with some of the company interviews, I have to also know these companies may not work for me as much after learning about them. So we have to understand that once we are already progressing further, it's okay to also reach out to the company and tell them that hey, you know what, maybe this is not working out for me, only because I realized I fit somewhere better. You know? So I think that kind of Excel sheet also gave me a very good um, overview of like the companies and the jobs I have to take. Yeah. yeah. One of the common questions I get is like, hey, do I need to do a cover letter? Or you just only customize the CD and send it up? Okay, I think that's like a trick question because for some companies I did do a cover letter, but not all companies. So I think I only did a cover letter for like two companies, and these two companies were companies that I was really passionate about. And yeah, really they get back to you? Um, only one got back. <laughs> yeah, so, so one got back. Um, actually, the other one, um, I actually did do a cover letter when I was very early uh, on my career, I was applying for jobs. I did do a couple of cover letters um, and one of them got back to me just this year actually. Yeah, so, so I got a response after a very long time. We call it the COVID letter. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is, yeah. So um, I applied back in 2020 uh, and then I got a response just when I was 
going to start venturing out for other jobs, right? Um, it was a bit surprising, but then it was also kind of good because I did interview the company uh, because it's something I was interested in back then, but I wanted to know what are they doing you now, like what are they innovating on now. So I just wanted to go for an interview. It really, I didn't have the intention to sign with them, uh, but just wanted to see what they had. So I think those kind of mock interviews as um, so that helped me. Yeah. Mm. I, I think that's super helpful and um, that's really, really valuable. Is there anything else you'd like to cover about positioning? Yeah, I think that that tells me. Okay, so thank you. like there are three tips over here, so we're gonna go to the second one. So you talk a little bit about designing your portfolio as if it's a product. So yeah, share with us a little bit more on that. Yeah, so um, I really like this. I think it's like UX designing a UX portfolio. So be it um, any type of portfolio, right? Think of it as a product itself. Uh, think of it, what do you exactly want to solve with your product? So what is the end goal of the product? So I think before starting any project, we will always have like our whys, our what. Basically, as we all our five W's and the one H, right? And from there, you think about, okay, so is this the type of uh, portfolio I want to do? Because based on your positioning early on, you know that um, you have a niche, you have a skill already, and then you want to um, show that further. And that's when you kind of have to think about how do I want to show it in my portfolio? So I kind of followed the design thinking process. So on my own experience, what I did was when I was applying to the companies, um, really to just first um, define what is my goals by doing this portfolio. And then eventually I thought, okay, who are the people that go and see my portfolio, right? So HR, senior designers, like design managers. So I knew that I had to make my portfolio set up to all these people as well. Um, and what I did was to talk to some like industry people and be like, hey, what are you looking for in a portfolio? So I understand the needs. So it's really understanding my user needs as well. Um, eventually I start um, ideating. So I just start putting out all my projects and like, oh, okay. And then I really go and look at other people's portfolios as well and be like, oh, what, how are they doing? What are they doing? And I realized that even the smallest bits actually makes a lot of difference. Um, prototype, I didn't really prototype. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I went on Figma and then I created like, um, all my um, screens and then I was like, okay, pixel by pixel, how should it look like as well? So it's because um, as a designer, you are applying to a design company for like UX or UI stuff. Um, and if your portfolio isn't up to the standard, then a, 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 a person that's going to be hiring you will question, hey, you know, how come this doesn't look like a UX UI portfolio, you know? So really thinking about the visuals as well has helped me, even the interactions, the motions that um, applies to my portfolio. So those kind of small things actually makes a difference because eventually the people that's going to be hiring you are going to see that these are things that you know matters to them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, that's, that's really it. Yeah, I think one thing important about the UX design process is also about iterations. I'm interested yes. how many revisions did you make before you before you say, okay, I'm, I'm good, I'm, I'm confident. Um, every day, no, just kidding. <laughs> I mean, like, every other time, I will just be like, I don't like this. Like, one day I'll like it, and the next day you wake up and you're like, no, I don't like this anymore. I think that's a very designer thing to have, actually. <laughs> yeah, but um, one thing I told myself is, um, what am I trying to communicate? So, my storytelling itself for my portfolio, and I knew that if after I have completed it, I'm ready to send it out, um, I'll just send it out for now, and if I get any response, I can always go back and tweak it. I can, I can always revisit my portfolio. It doesn't mean I send it out, it's you know, so you can always revisit it, always improve it. So I think it's like you mentioned, it's iteration. So even after going for interviews, you can still improve on it. Yeah. yeah. And and I personally know like many of us designers, we get a little bit uh, self-critical, right? So we're like, oh, you know, I'm too afraid to send it out. It's not perfect enough. Uh, do you have any advice for that? You know, like how like I just do it, just send it out. Um, okay, so I think for me, what I told myself is that um, there's no harm in rejection. I think you need to be comfortable with rejection. It's okay to um, not, you know, uh, get a job. It's, it's okay to like them rejecting you, but that doesn't stop us from trying. I think you can always continue to learn, continue to improve. I think getting those um, advices. So I remember one of my first interviews I had with a very good company, I would say, uh, was that they paid, I wasn't prepared. Um, I didn't do a great job. Um, and I kind of got that feeling when he was giving me all those advices, uh, but I kind of put it in a hard way initially. But I told myself that, hey, these are all feedbacks that, you know, will be good for me. And what I did was to take those feedback and try and tweak how I was going to present myself and better prepare myself as well. But funny, I did get a call back from that same company um, for a second interview. So I was very surprised actually. I was, I was so surprised. I was like, 
okay, no, I didn't expect this at all. I was just telling you that the went so bad, you know. But um, I think that's the thing. I think having the confidence in you um, um, will really help. And as much as um, you know, there are days where you might face like an imposter syndrome. I think it's okay to tell yourself that everybody goes through that. I think even for myself, I go through that almost every other day. I think it's very normal. And when I talk to my design manager um, or my senior designer, there was one time um, I talked about imposter syndrome, and he was telling me that, "Hey, I have it too. Like you know, you're not alone in this." Yeah. yeah. So do you want to explain a little bit, like with maybe with examples, what imposter syndrome means uh, to you? I think for me it's like, am I doing a good job? I think this kind of questions that's popping your head. Like when I see my design, is it a good design? Or I see a new innovative design. Why am I not doing that? You know, that is so cool, that's so innovative. But I think ideally it's knowing what your goals are, what are we trying to solve, and what is the problem you're addressing, right? So when you talk about those kind of things, it's how you kind of tackle the imposter syndrome. And one thing that I kept reiterating, reiterating to myself back then was that I need to be comfortable with it being a bad thing. And if it's a bad thing, it's a good thing for me because I can learn from it. You know, I can always learn and grow from it. So if it's a bad news today, it means it's a good news tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. I, I love how you re reframe that, and I don't think a lot of people can do do that Jedi mind trick. Uh, so I think I think it's great, uh, and, and it's really really good advice. But I I think that for a lot of people, we need rejections, and sometimes we get really discouraged by by that, and and then we have this imposter syndrome, and we haven't really broken into the industry. We don't have that foundation, and, and, and moreover, like in your case, you don't have that degree. Then maybe you start questioning yourself on on the decisions you made. Um, yeah, have you ever felt like that? And, and how do you kind of like manage it? You know, to stay positive and optimistic. I think when I was um, applying for NTC, especially, I actually faced a couple of rejections. Um, actually, a lot of them, and I knew I was thinking, is this the career I wanted to do? I did question that a couple of times when I kind of breaking into the industry. But then um, one day, um, very funny, what I did was to go on LinkedIn. I really just start talking to people, just reaching out to them and be like, hey, you know, can you give me an advice on what to do and, and, and what's going to happen? And this time, I wasn't in the industry yet. So I did not know many peers around me. So what I had to do was to go and find those people, go and find those people I can talk to, um, which I also covered my next slide about those networking stuff. Uh, but yeah, I think ideally for me was I, the rejection shouldn't uh, push you down. Like it, it, it just shouldn't push you down because um, you should tell yourself that you know everybody's learning, everybody's growing. The industry is always evolving. Um, back then we call it UX designer, like four, just four years ago, four five years ago, and today we're running product designer. So it's just very different. And I think um, things always evolve, things always change, and you can also always you know keep growing. Yeah. So don't let one setback just fail you entirely. Yeah. That's good advice. So with that, let's go to the next tip. You mentioned the importance of networking and, and how it helped you land your first role. So tell us a little bit more about that. Okay, so um, back in 2020, um, I just finished my national service and I tried to apply for a couple of jobs and then I got rejected, right? Um, I knew something was wrong and I knew I wasn't reaching out to the right people and knowing what the industry was even about. Um, I did send out a couple of LinkedIn and even then, <laughs> even for those LinkedIn messages, I got rejected as well. I mean, I didn't get a reply back. And I think it's okay because they are busy people as well and they have their time as well. But those two people that I got um, a call back from and they said that, hey, um, you know what, let's talk, let's just chat. Um, you can just share your portfolio with us. I was sharing my portfolio and they were giving me like critiques as well. And during that time, we didn't have platforms such as Curious Call or like any other platforms. You don't know, we have um, other mentoring platforms as well. We didn't have all those. So it was kind of a struggle and it was a pandemic. So I did struggle a little bit, but I reached out to these people and fortunately they gave me very good advices, um, which allowed me to print my portfolio. So always talk to people and really share all those raw things, raw files, and really get advices from them. I think that's what helped me. Even if you think it's um, unpolished, it's fine. It's really fine to be unpolished. You don't have to have everything perfect to the pixel. Yeah, so I, I think it goes back to the second point, right? So you're collecting user feedback. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So I think those um, help me because I thought, okay, I've got a good job, I've created a portfolio already, I'm going to send it out, but then you face all these rejections, right? And that's when those networking actually helped, and especially during the pandemic when then there wasn't all these mentoring uh, platforms, I felt like, hey, who am I supposed to reach out to? So I think that was a struggle that I had, but yeah, networking really helped me, so talk to the peers, talk to the industry people as well, and I think that eventually will help you um, push you forward as well. I'm going to ask, and go, ask you to go a little bit more in depth. 
what, exactly what would you say in your message when you reach out to them that made them like say yes, like roughly? Yeah. Okay, I think um, if I remember correctly, it's been three years. Um, I said, uh, hi guys, or hi, um, I'm actually um, applying for jobs for UX um, and I really like the, the company and the work you're doing at the company. I see that you are like a product designer or a UX designer in your company. Um, is it okay if I could get like five or ten minutes of your time just to like run you through some of my projects and all that? And they're like, hey, just get you a 30 minutes chat with me. You know, that's when like I, I, I was able to like say, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think one thing I really like is the generosity of this community over here in, in UX and, and how we, like people always give back to the next generation, like what you're doing right now. So that's that's really awesome. Um, and like what what if they give you 30 minutes? Like, do you do anything after that as a uh, yeah, so I got like a telegram, so he said, message me through telegram, and he gave me his telegram, and he was like, giving me advice along the way, uh, but I think what he wasn't like a mentor, I would say, because um, it was just like a two session thing, and then eventually I said thank you, and, and I really treated him for a coffee as well, so just paying him back <laughs> some of the help he has given me, so I think that, that kind of, that's how we kind of um, stay in touch. So you do like update this, this person, like how, how's your career progress and what you're doing? Um, not anymore, I would say. Actually, it was just those two sessions that I had, okay. and eventually I, I didn't update anymore. Um, but I still keep in touch with a lot of my peers as well, just to know, just to stay relevant, right? Also, and to know what the industry knows. Yeah. I'm quite curious about one thing. Why, why are you trying so hard to get into NTUC? Like, most people want to get into Grab, most people want to get into DBS, or like uh, Facebook. Why are you trying so hard for NTUC? Uh, good question. Not. <laughs> so I, I wasn't trying NDC actually. I was trying DDS. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So okay. I was really trying for DDS um, at the start. But I think NDC got uh, I got a call back from NDC after all those iterations on my portfolio, right? And that's when I decided to go with NDC at the time. And the reason why I kind of went with NDC, I didn't have much experience. Um, and I think one mistake that uh, people tend to do, or I've read online, is that they tend to just jump to any opportunity that they see. Like, if I have an offer straight away, I'm going to go for it. I think that shouldn't be the case. Um, I know it can seem hard to like get an offer, but there's a reason why we would apply for a company in the first place, right? Um, when I was applying, or when I was starting out, and I was applying to a few companies, I realized one of the companies that I applied to didn't really, um, like, I didn't really like what they were doing, uh, but I didn't get an offer. So I told myself, and that was my first offer before NTC itself, so I was like, hey, like, should I just take it because I've already got an offer, you know? It, it can kickstart my career, but I told myself that, okay, let's just read it out, let's just see, and I told the company that maybe give me a week to think about it, and then I'll get back to you. And eventually I said, hmm, I don't think this is the right path for me. So I, even though I was struggling at the time to get a job, I told myself that it's a decision I had to make, and I can go for mine. I, I can still try to explore other opportunities. Yeah. I, I love that mindset, because saying no to something means that you can say yes to other things that yes. matter more to you. Yeah, right? exactly. So I think that's conviction in that. I think that's that's not easy, especially given that that was quite a desperate situation. Yeah, it was pandemic. I was like, everybody is like looking for jobs. People are getting retrenched and all that. So yeah, it was it was definitely tough. Yeah. And and you mentioned there was pandemic and, and there was a lot of inconveniences. And um, did you, did you felt the pressure from the competition? Because I mean, I noticed as an instructor and an educator that the pressure is just going up, right? The standards is just going up in terms of like the portfolio. So. You know, what, what did you do to prepare yourself or differentiate yourself uh, from the other candidates? Yeah, I think um, for me, um, like you mentioned, it's very true. Standards always go up. We are always competing with everyone in the industry. Not just like the entry designer, but even the senior designers as well. So everybody is competing at a certain level. But I think what makes a person stand out is, again, the small little things that people notice. Are you giving a good experience? So, for example, in my portfolio, I decided to include motion stuff um, a little bit and also think about my interaction, um, how like how how people can interact with as well. So that's kind of how I I would say I stood out. Um, I decided to make it a little use all the little things to make it special. Yeah. So it sounds like you paid a lot of attention to detail in your portfolio and you added little touches. Like, did anyone give you like positive feedback around that? Mm, okay, so I wouldn't say that they noticed it, but that's the thing, right? Like certain things you may not notice, but it eventually makes the whole experience. 
For example, um, I really like what Apple just recently did uh, with the whole notch, um, and they are making it like you know dynamic and all that. Um, they call it dynamic island. I don't like the name of that. <laughs> yeah. But that being said, like this small thing, which is a trouble to the user, they make it so delightful and so nice to use, right? So I think even though it's such a big improvement, I think it, it is an experience. So really, the entire experience is different. Or even how um, smooth the app is, or like, even how I'm using my things. Um, those kind of small things actually make a big difference. So out of cur curiosity, I've actually went to check out your portfolio website several times. Like, did you code it yourself, or you know what's happening? Because I can't. It doesn't look like a standard kind of like template uh, design. Yeah. So <laughs> what I did was to actually look at all those templates out there first. I went to Squarespace, Wix, and I was like looking at templates and trying to do templates. And I was like. I don't like this, like this is not me, you know, this doesn't show my personality at all. So I decided to spend my time. So at that time I was still working, um, and I decided to spend my time um, after work, just about one to two hours, and look at other portfolios. What are they doing? What is different? What is like all the small things that I was mentioning? Um, eventually I decided to go with like um, a platform like Webflow. Um, and I think ultimately it doesn't matter what platform you use, but if you want that level of um, like let's say uh, customization, then yes, it matters. And if you are thinking about, oh, I don't know how to go, I don't know how to go as well, like, I really don't know how to go. Uh, but yeah, so Webflow, I think it just took a little bit of the learning curve, like any other software, but it really helped me. I think not just to do my portfolio, but to understand how development works itself, like the so small things as well. Yeah. And I think for everyone else's information, you can also use Squarespace and UX Folio, which are very, very common options. So uh, Webflow is slightly more intermediate and advanced, I think. Yeah, I and mean, if you're willing to spend a little bit more time on it, then definitely, yeah. But I did start out when I was applying very early, I did start out with UX for you as well. Um, and I think ultimately, even though those small things matter, what eventually you want to convey, again, is your goal. Um, why are you doing a portfolio in the first place and the kind of story you want to tell as well. So um, just really think back to my portfolio, right? I think um, keeping it short really helped me as well uh, because people are just planting too, right? And having images and all those really helped as well, yeah. Um, so a lot of people look at your portfolios on your mobile phones these days. So I'm just wondering, like, did you do anything to uh, mobile optimize it? Because I I know some of our instructors complain about student portfolios not being mobile optimized, and yeah, like I just I'm just interested if you did anything. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, I, I try to make it um, um responsive. So like even tablet, mobile, like any screen size. I still want it to be legible, readable. Again, we are in the UX industry, so experience matters, and all these things, um, people will notice. So I wanted to ensure that all this is covered, <laughs> so that I am, I, because if I'm going to be a blind designer, then I would also like to know that um, people looking at my design portfolio know that this guy can design, right? Yeah. That's great. So uh, I, I think the AV team, can we switch to Sligo uh, to, to see if we have any questions and if the audience wants any questions and um, with the possible uh, can pass me the iPad and well, we can take questions on the ground at the moment. Yeah. All right. Okay, cool. So I, I think just to continue on, on the track while we're questions and uh, for those in the audience or those viewing the live stream, you're welcome to stream in some questions uh, while we do some discussion. Um, so was that like a very conscious effort uh, I heard in terms of like, you selecting the kind of companies you want to apply for? Because you said 15 companies seem excessive. Yeah, so I, I want to understand the thinking behind it, like what would you have done differently if not 15? Um, I think I would have selected companies that I really know that I wanted to go for um, because what I was trying to do with those 15 companies is to know um, the industry. So I knew that I wanted to apply for e-commerce, I wanted to apply for something fintech related or maybe logistics related. So I kind of applied to all these three industries from different companies. Uh, but if I could have done it differently, I think I would have told myself that, hey, I want to try out one industry and just apply to those companies which kind of cover the industry and not exceeding maybe five and then see how the response is. The response is bad, and then try to continue to reiterate it. Yeah. Okay. I think that's that's really fair. And I I also quite interested. You know, initially you only had projects from school, right? So these are not exactly commercial projects. So in the initial mix of your portfolio, what did you put? Did you put 
like your project from school or was it like a freelance project? What's going on? Uh, so I did put my one freelance project, but that had nothing to do with UX. It was more like branding and graphic design, but I still did that way. And then I had like two other projects before, which was like school projects. Uh, but what I try to do is really convey what the project was about and like the kind of impact it made. Because we, when your product hasn't launched, you can't really make an impact, right? But what I was going to do or actually did was to actually survey people um, based on like prototype. So I showed my friends actually and like get their customer feedback and whatnot, and then try to put this feedback and like how it improved. So it's just showing them um, like the process itself. And again, it's about the entry level, right? If you are an entry level um, portfolio, I think the expectations of the person who's hiring you would also not be, or oh, they need to know everything, they need to be like a senior designer or something like that. So I think showing them that you have good knowledge of um, your process, as well as um, good UI skills, can actually make a very good um, um, entry level portfolio. And, and what I hear you say is that you spend extra time to go and collect user feedback so so that you have a stronger case study to, to present. Yeah, because I think um, at least collecting it from like 20 to 30 people is already kind of numbers and I think those surveys help me to kind of show them, oh, this is the possible impact that I could make. So um, they know, and as a person that's hiring, right, again, thinking from their point of view, they'll be like, Hey, so this guy is thinking about his users. This guy is thinking about like what he wants to do and how he wants to improve things. So they know that you're thinking of the longer term, not just like a short vision. Yeah, that's excellent. So someone in the audience asked, how long did you spend to do your portfolio from ideation until your first uh, MVP? Um, I think it took me about two months ish, I guess. And this this was not full time, right? You were just doing it out outside of what whatever work you were doing. Yeah, exactly. So I was not like full time. So each day I spent about one, two hours um, to look at other portfolios um, and also do my own entire design thinking process. Yeah, so about one to two months. Um, so someone mentioned like in school, we're taught to follow, you know, the UX design process from end to end, from research to design to like testing uh, for your case study. Is, is, is it the same in a real work scenario? Or is it different? Um, I would say it's different. Um, but at the same time, I think having that knowledge was really good. Because what we learned from school um, was very knowledgeable to me. I think till today, um, I would say that those processes or those lectures that I've been for has helped me to stay relevant and stay knowledgeable. So that is one. Uh, secondly, do we do that in companies? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So I think it really depends on the project. So let's say if a project is just a very small tweak, company wouldn't spend the entire process trying to do that. Um, so they would straight away maybe jump to ideation and testing it out and see if something works or not. Um, let's say it's a bigger project, then yes, probably I'll take the entire process of like brainstorming with my stakeholders, doing research and like having those whole um, thing featured um, and launched and then also testing and seeing what's the impact of the matrix and things like that. Yeah. I think I'm going to ask you about three more questions and then uh, I know we have a lot of enthusiasm Questioning you, and you're, uh, you're all welcome to talk to Subra a little bit after this. So, uh, you know, someone's asking, what's the fastest way for me to improve my UI visual design skills? Um, what's the fastest way? Um, I think there's no fastest way for anything actually. Um, it's a constant iteration and improvement, right? Like, if you are improving today, tomorrow something new is going to come already. So, you always have to just keep um, relevant, stay relevant. And I think, um, if I'm not wrong, I personally also took a course in uh, UI also while I was in NQC because I realized I was lagging behind. Like I needed, I wanted to learn more, so that's when I took a course um, in UI design itself. Yeah, awesome. So, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your proudest achievement in your career so far? Um, I wouldn't say career, but I think I would say um, the, the award that I mentioned just now. I think that. Um, really pushed me forward to know that this is the industry I want to do. But one thing um, within my career that I'm very proud of is actually not the most proudest moment is when I actually presented a work and I kind of got um, rejected for it. I was told that this is a really bad work and like why is this a bad work and things like that. Um, that was like a turning point because I knew what I can present to my stakeholders. I knew what I should present to my stakeholders as well. So I think that one incident really helped me and I think that even though not the proudest moment, I would say it's the moment that I was able to understand how to do stakeholders as well. 
Mm, I think that's a very important skill, how, how we communicate. And I know someone was asking a question about the important skills that UX designers should have. So other than being able to communicate to stakeholders, you know, what other skills should UX designers have? Yeah, I think communication also comes with like conviction. So how you convince people that something works. Um, and I think really having empathy for your product um, also helps. So just very timely, um, just yesterday, uh, my manager was sending us a video about how one of my product managers actually communicated empathy to our senior director um, and it really won a lot of people's heart, uh, hearts. Yeah. So uh, really having empathy um, and storytelling and how you kind of craft your story is very, very important. Yeah. And it sounds a lot like soft skills to me and, and I, I don't believe a lot of schools uh, cover and, and touch on that and it's almost like you have to figure it out uh, yourself and working uh, with yeah. people. <laughs> Do you, do you have some quick tips on how people can be better at this? Um, so communication, I think it's really talking to people. Really, so I, I read this article as well. They say eighty percent listening, twenty percent talking. So eighty percent just listen, just observe and see what they're doing, what kind of cues they're giving as well. And that's how I also learn from my peers. And the twenty percent of talking is asking these good kind of questions as well. So I think yeah, that's how I still um, improve myself. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, how did you land a job at Food Panda? Yeah, because you mentioned something about interviewing a lot for NTUC, uh, but how did you land a role in Food Panda? Um, so, with Food Panda, I think I actually reached out um, to one of my colleagues who was working there, my ex colleagues who was working there, um, and then I got a referral. So, I think that's why networking has helped a lot as well. So, I got a referral, but that being said, I still had to go through six rounds i guess <laughs> yeah so about six rounds of like um, going through each um, of my portfolio um, and then whiteboard challenge um, talking to my managers um, my senior director so yeah it really took me that six stages eventually to get a job at uh, food panda yeah, yeah I, i'm not sure if six rounds sounds excessive but it sounds about right for startups <laughs> so um yeah finally do you have any word of advice for uh, some of you juniors here who are trying to do a career switch to UI and UX or break into the industry, like what, what are some of your um, you know, parting tips? Um, I didn't join the industry, um, I, I joined the industry not long ago as well, it was just three years ago, and I think I could really resonate with uh, what some of you might feel over here today, but that being said, don't lose hope, because I think there's always hope out there, uh, people are willing to help, so just reach out to help. Like if you guys need help, just reach out to me via LinkedIn or something. Uh, but I think have confidence in what you can do and really be um, strong in your own skill set. I think that can eventually help you uh, to know and present yourself in uh, what you're good at. Yeah. yeah, that's really excellent advice. And uh, team, uh, you can actually switch back to uh, Subra's last slide. So um, thank you so much for giving us and sharing with us so much, uh, very, very concrete tips today, uh, not just on the technical side, but also on the mindset of how to like stay strong and stay optimistic in this journey. And I think, I think if, uh, there's a quote that I often share with my students, uh, what is delayed is not denied. So I, I don't think just because you get rejection, that means that's the end of the world and you're not gonna get a job. Right? So uh, with that, can we please give Supra a round of applause for his charity? <laughs> and you're welcome to connect with him over on LinkedIn uh, and also check out his portfolio to, uh, to learn a little bit more why we're talking about this portfolio. So with that, uh, thank you, Supra. Uh, thank you, you so me. much. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Curious Boy and Dylan as well for this opportunity. Uh, yeah, happy to talk to you after this. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome.